beginning our series today that's, that, that I've, I've titled Rediscovering Christmas. And so I'm going to get right into it today. And, and I want to give just an overlay of, of kind of what we're going to be looking at, especially today. But so many times Christmas, we go through it every year. It's something we do. We experience it. We, we, we kind of, you know, this Christmas, maybe like last Christmas, and you get the same decorations out. You get the same tree out. You get all that stuff, up, stuff out. But what happens is, is we can lose the punch. We can lose the significance of Christmas. But before we get into anything else about Christmas today, I want to talk about this little scene we got going on right here. Because this kind of is a big deal. This is the meaning of Christmas. This has everything to do with Christmas. And so many times we can look past this and see this and not realize this is actually speaking to us today. And I believe that God wants to speak to us as we step into the Christmas season. Of He wants to speak to us from this nativity. So we're going to be looking at lessons from the nativity today. It's going to be a great journey as we look into this. So no matter where you're at today in your journey, I believe God wants to speak to you today. No matter if you're at your highest place or your lowest place in Christmas season history, God wants to speak to you today. I believe that the Word of God and the message of God is always speaking to you and wants to transform you, wants to meet you right where you are. Here's an incredible thing about God. In a room our size with a couple thousand people over, over two services, God knows where each and every one of you are. And he can meet you specifically where you are. He knows what you're dealing with. He knows what you're struggling with. He knows what you need. He knows the secrets of your heart. He knows if you and your wife got into an argument on the way here today. Everybody say amen to that. And God still wants to touch you. And he can meet us, he can make every one of us in this room feel like we're the only one in this room all at the same time. And that's the God that we serve. And I believe that's what he wants to speak to us from this incredible message of the nativity today. And we're going to move through it. We're going to be looking at what each one of these characters or lessons from each one of these elements and characters of the nativity today. Hopefully it kicks our Christmas season off. And then when we see one of these through the rest of the next three weeks or so, we're going to be reminded of God's faithfulness and goodness to us. Amen? We're going to begin today by looking in Luke chapter 2. And we're going to be reading one of the classic passages of Scripture about the Christmas story, what we celebrate at this season, at this time in December. And this is what it says. So Joseph also, he went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He was going there for a census. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, wasn't married yet, was pledged and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in, in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And this is where we begin with this whole story of the nativity. There's a reason why it's a stable. There's a reason why there's some animals. There's a reason why there's these three wise men that are hanging out over here and Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus and a camel and an angel. And all of these, have a re- have, there's a reason why they're here. And we look at them every year and, and sometimes we forget actually why they're there, why they're included. And so we're going to be looking at nine elements of the nativity today that they're just very basic principles that I just, I really believe the Lord wants to speak to us about them today. And I wanted to bring something really deep and profound that you'll leave here to to leave here today and be like, I never thought of that about Christmas. And the Lord was like, why are you trying so hard? Just, just, just speak what this means. And so that's what I'm going to do today. And so nine lessons from the nativity from each, but the first person we're going to learn a lesson from in God's interaction with them comes from number one there on your notes. We're going to be looking at Mary. And this lesson that God speaks to us from the nativity and hopefully transforms us and we can rediscover the beauty of the nativity this year is this, this lesson from Mary that impossibilities become challenges when we submit to God. Because many of us live in this world of impossibilities. We think there ain't no way that's going to happen. That's an impossible thing. There's no way God can do that, or God can do this, or God can change them, or God can rescue me in this financial situation. Or God can heal me, or God can, what, it's, it's an impossibility. 
But with Mary, Mary tells us that our impossibilities, what stands in front of us and and punches us in the forehead, says that actually they become challenges. In other words, things that we can work through and will work through when we submit to God. So nine months before the birth of Jesus, God began putting this whole story together. And uh, he sent an angel, Gabriel, which is this, little, this, this person right here, this little winged figure right here, Gabriel. Sent an angel, Gabriel, to talk to Mary. And sent to a young teenager, Mary was, was a young teenager who lived in Nazareth. And Gabriel announced to Mary, he said this, just so you know, Mary, God wants you to be the mother of his son. And she was like, that's awesome. And we find out she was freaked out. Can you imagine, though, for a moment, just, just for a moment, the fear, the confusion that must have been feeling Mary's heart? And she figured out exactly, like she heard him, she was like, okay, w- wait a minute. Are you saying, yes, that's what I'm saying. And what I love about this is that Mary, after Gabriel tells her all this wonderful stuff, she's like, that's really great, Gabriel. Time out. I need to just let you know something, that the impo- what you just said is impossible. Because I need to share with you some things that it's going to be a bit of a struggle. And we find this in Luke chapter 1. And this is what Mary says. Um, how will this be? How is this going to happen that I'm going to have a baby and it's going to be the Son of God in me? How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. So Mary was young, but she did know some very basic things about life. You can't have a baby if you're a virgin. And the angel asked, well, the angel answered, well, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High God will enshadow you. And Mary's like, oh, okay, now I get it. Remember, she had never walked through this before. She would never experienced this before. It wasn't like she was like, oh, that's right. Oh, well, why didn't you say that in the beginning? No. She was like, I'm okay. Um, and then and in her still confusion and all of this, he, and it says, will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born that I've just told you is going to come from you will be called the Son of God. And then this is what Mary answers. I am the Lord's servant. And what I love about this, this doesn't say, and Mary no longer had any questions. It doesn't say, and Mary understood completely. It doesn't say, and the Mary was like, oh, sorry, I, I should have known that's what we were talking about. No, she still had questions. She still had doubts. She still didn't know how all this was going to work together. But this is how she responded to the word of the Lord. I am the Lord's servant. May your word be to me. May your word to me be fulfilled. In other words, she began to submit her will to God's will at that moment. Gabriel told Mary that, listen, Mary, nothing is impossible for God. And this is a lesson we learned from Mary, that when we submit to God, when we submit to his ways, when we come underneath him and say, I don't understand everything, that God takes what seems to be an impossibility And he begins to make it possible. It's still a challenge. It still has its has the things you got to deal with, but it's still possible. That which was impossible now has become possible. And many times God's promises to you, or what God has said to you or over you, or you may come into a marriage and, and all these amazing promises, and you get a few years into them, and all of a sudden you think this is impossible. How is this gonna work out? Or you, you have a child, and, and, and this child has, has came with all this promise, and then as the child grows older, all these impossibilities begin to meet you. This is impossible. And all of a sudden, we begin to struggle, and we begin to, to, to wrestle through things in our own hearts. But the story of Mary tells us this. When we come and we submit our wills to God, that he takes what is impossible and he takes it and all of a sudden he begins to make it possible. It's still a challenge for us, but it's possible. So whatever you're facing today, whatever it is that you're looking at, you think this is impossible. My finances, it's impossible. My marriage, it's impossible. My children, it's impossible. Cancer, it's impossible. Or maybe you're barren. You think, I can't have kids because it's impossible. It's impossible. Listen, our God is the God of taking impossibilities and making them possible. Amen. 
And this is the beauty of what Mary teaches us. So when you look at the nativity scene over the next several weeks, remember when you see Mary, she says this to you. You just imagine her little porcelain lips moving. What is impossible to you is possible with God. That would be weird. Actually, don't imagine that. That would be weird. I don't know where that came from. Don't do that. But remember, that's what God is saying to the life of Mary. He's saying this, I'm not looking for somebody who's got it all together. I'm not looking for somebody who, who can give me all the answers. I'm looking for someone who says, yes, God, may, may whatever is in your word and whatever you've spoken to me, may that be true and use me to accomplish it. That's what, it, listen, obedience is our job. The results are God's job. So release yourself from trying to, like holding your obedience from God because you don't know how God's going to work it out. Don't, don't hold your obedience hostage. No, God, wait, I'll obey if, if, if you'll help me understand how you're going to do it. And God's like, no, no, it doesn't work that way. God's saying, I'm asking you for your obedience and then trust me that I will work it out on your behalf. Amen? Second lesson we learn from the nativity comes from one of the most forgotten people of the nativity story, and that is Joseph. And Joseph's lesson tells us this. We still need to trust God even when we don't understand what he is doing in the lives of our loved ones. And this is a challenge for many of us today because there are things that are going on in people's lives, in, the, in our loved ones' lives that we don't totally understand. And we wrestle with it. Joseph, by many scholars, is called the forgotten man of the Christmas story. The Bible Hear this, the Bible doesn't record one single word that he said. Not one. So I think he must have been a strong, probably silent type that just obeyed God and followed God. But I've often wondered, how did Mary break the news to Joseph? How did that conversation go? Maybe they were talking about wedding plans, and maybe it went something like this. Joseph, I'm so excited. Rachel, I heard Rachel was coming to the wedding. I just, I just heard my cousin Elizabeth coming. Oh, and she's pregnant. Isn't that amazing? She's old, and she's pregnant, so that's really cool. And, and uh, it, this is amazing. And by the way, I'm pregnant, but do you want, you think we should have beef or fish at the reception? What are you thinking? And Joseph's like, oh, wait, 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 time out. What did you just say? I said, should we have beef or should we have fish? At the, at... No, no, before that, about the whole pregnant part. It's okay, Joseph. Don't worry about it. The angel came to me and he told me, I'm going to have God's son. And the next thing I knew, I was pregnant. And, and, and don't worry, Joseph, I'm still a virgin. So anyway, back to the reception. Let's talk about it. Like, I don't know how that conversation went. Guaranteed, it was weird. Guaranteed. I mean, what, what do you think? I think his reaction was, sweetheart, that's so wonderful. I'm so excited for you. Um, you know, I've always wanted to have a God child. And I, there's two, double meaning on God's, anyway. I'm so excited for God's plan for your life. And listen, I've worked, um, and some of you have as well, worked with a lot of carpenters. Um, and that's not how most of them would react to this news. <laughs> he, he had to think, I know I'm not the dad. Don't, listen, don't give me this baloney about you being a virgin and you're pregnant and the Holy Spirit. Yeah, blame it on God, Mary. Yeah, just do that one. I mean, what, you think I'm an idiot? Like at first, Joseph, he had to be hurt. I mean, remember, there's no template for this. This isn't like... <laughs> He's like, you remember, Joseph, this happened to your cousin Susan? Like, no, this had never happened before. Ever. And we also know that Joseph, he, he, this hit him so hard. He, but he was, he was a man, he was a quiet man. He had determined, I'm just going to break off the commitment I've made to marry her, and I'm going to do it silently. I'm moving on with my In other words, he was saying, I'm moving on with my life. That's what he was saying. Matthew 1, 18 to 21 says this. This is how the birth of Jesus, Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law. In other words, he was a good man. 
and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. In other words, because he was faithful to the, wall, to the law, he wasn't going to go through with the marriage because he was faithful to the law. In other words, he wasn't going to marry a woman who was pregnant outside of, of wedlock because he was faithful to the law. And so he just said, I, I'm not going to do that. And so he's going to quietly just walk away. And he had it in his mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Actually, the word instead of Jesus, the proper words was Yeshua, which is Savior, Deliverer, because he will save his people From their sins. And Joseph went along with God's plan. Joseph submitted to God's plan. Even though it affected his his soon-to-be wife more than it affected him. He went along with it. He didn't understand it. He didn't have all the answers. But he said, God, I'm, I'm going to come along. I'm going to support. Come alongside what you're doing. Even though I made, this isn't the perfect case scenario. You didn't reveal this. You didn't like tell me this. You didn't plant this seed in my heart. This isn't the desires of my heart. And so many people say, listen, if, if the God's will always begins with the desires of your heart. And then it just works out that way. Sometimes it works out that way. Sometimes it does not. I guarantee you, Joseph's desire of his, of his heart was not that his soon-to-be wife would be pregnant with a child and would come to him and say, I know we're not pregnant, but I I know we're not married, but I'm pregnant and I'm a virgin. Guaranteed that wasn't in his heart. This was like out of nowhere. And he loved Mary. But the lesson that we learn is that we may not understand what God's doing in the lives of our loved ones, but many times we still have to trust God. We have to stay faithful to our loved ones. We have to come alongside and support them. We need to strengthen them. Mary, she had her own questions. She had her own doubts. And Joseph, as, as, as a man in her life, had to come alongside and strengthen her and speak life to her and, 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 bring, and bring encouragement to her. Joseph didn't understand the full plan, but he understood that I'm going to trust God, that God is working in the life of Mary even though I don't understand it nor do I see it. So the lesson for us is this, same way. When God begins to move, let's say you're married and God begins to move in one of your spouse's um, hearts about doing something and you're not totally for sure about it. And you're like, okay, well, I just want to support you and strengthen you in here to pursue what God is doing. You may not understand it, but the reality is God still called us to strengthen and support that. For some of you parents, it's very difficult as you have children and your children, uh, things seem to be going going wild and crazy and, and, and you're like, what's going on? And what Joseph tells us is this, is that you can trust that God loves your loved one more than you love them. That God has a plan for your children more than you have a plan for your children. That God's ways are actually higher than your ways. That his thoughts are actually greater towards your baby than what your thoughts are towards your baby. This is God's plan and God's purpose. And what Joseph tells us is that when we don't understand what's going on in the life of our family, that we can say, God, I still trust you. I still give you my my hope. I still give you my, my, my devotion and I give you my life. And that's what Joseph was doing. And I think for some of you parents this Christmas Christmas season, you need to know this, that don't turn your back on your children when they're not lining up exactly how you want them to line up. Don't do that. Imagine if Joseph would have said, you know, Mary, Mary, enough, Mary. I don't understand what God's doing. I'm out of here. Now, Mary wasn't in rebellion, and she wasn't running from God, but Joseph did not understand what was going on in her life. And so you have the opportunity to come alongside what God is doing in your children's life and begin to strengthen it, support it, speak into them. Don't desert them. Don't cut them off. Don't think if it doesn't line up with what I want, then I'm out of here. Don't do that. Stay faithful to your children. Stay faithful to your teenagers. You got to do what you got to do to lead and run your home and put boundaries and and don't be wishy-washy. You lead your home, but you love Love those children. I don't mean this to be rude, but sometimes you got to love the hell out of your children. 
I hope you catch that. Don't hear what I didn't say. Because sometimes the enemy is coming and he's, he's, put, he's put stuff in your kids' lives and they're, they're hard and they're rebellious. There is nothing more, more um, powerful than the love of a parent to say, look at me, look at me, look at me. I love you. I don't like everything that's going on in your life. But you can run, but you can't hide from my love. I will chase you down and give you a kiss in front of everybody. <laughs> it's important when you don't understand. What God's doing in the lives of your loved ones. Remember Joseph. He was faithful. And he allowed the outcome to be in God's hands, not his. Number three. Another lesson we learn from this nativity is we learn from the stable. And this is what the stable says to us. In the harsh realities of life, Jesus really does understand. He really does understand. See, if, if, if I was God and I was bringing my son into the earth, I mean, I, what's interesting is at, at Bethlehem, right up the hill from Bethlehem used to be Herod's palace, and it was lit up so that it could be seen from miles around. If I, if I was God, I'd say, you know what? I want my son to be born in that palace. But God didn't do it that way. God allowed his son to be born in a stable. He could have allowed him to be born anywhere. But he allowed him to be born in a stable. There was no room for him at wherever they were looking to stay. And we, all, we know that story. And so he ends up at a stable. How do we know it's a stable? We know because he was placed in a manger. And where there was a manger, there were animals. Where there's animals, it's a place where you keep them. It's called a stable. And that's where they was. And even, even today, you can go to a place where, where they would keep these, these, uh, these animals. They're not an actual stable. It's actually it's kind of like a cave that's carved out in the, in the side of a mountain. But you can see, you can see where, where Jesus was probably born. He was tucked away in a cave where there were all these other animals. And out of all the places he could have been born, Jesus was born. The wrong side of the tracks in the wrong family. With the wrong, side of the, the wrong side of the farm animals behind, here he is in a manger, in a stable. He wasn't given every opportunity. And God wants you to know this today, that Jesus understands when you feel like you are at the, the wrong end of the rope, when you feel like you're at the wrong end of the stick, when you feel like things aren't working out the way that you want them to work out. And whatever difficulties that life hands you, Jesus, he's already been there. Jesus was actually, as an infant, he was a refugee. He was fleeing from Egypt with his family. He was a hardworking man. For 30 years he worked in construction. He understood poverty. He understood discrimination. He understood rejection. He was ridiculed. Think about this. He was ridiculed. He, he, he was ministering for three years from the age of 30 to 33. For three years, every day of his ministry, he was ridiculed. He was told he was demon-possessed. He was told that he was of the devil. He was told that he was crazy. He, I, every day he was told he was criticized. Every day. He was told he was nothing. He was told what he said he was he wasn't. Every day. It has to have an effect on you over time. But Jesus kept on. In his short time in ministry, he kept on. On on his, his, his darkest day, his closest friends abandoned him. And so whatever experience it is in your life that you feel like, you know what? This is too much for me. I can't handle it. The pressure is too great. You come to your breaking point, and you're beginning to cry out. Say, nobody understands what it's like to be me. That's a lie. You need to look at the staple. Jesus understands. He understands what you've been through. He understands the pain that you're dealing with. He understands the dark loneliness that you feel. He gets it, and he understands it. That's what the stable says to us. And that's what we need to remember. When you look at this manger over the next several weeks, you need to know the stable says to me, Jesus understands. He gets it. 
So I'm not to live in this world that I'm all alone and no one understands. There might be people around you that don't understand, but you need to know this. Jesus understands, and you can run to him, and you can find comfort in him, and you can find peace in him, and he can wrap his arms around you, and he can bring healing to your dark feelings of loneliness and emptiness because Jesus understands. Amen? The fourth lesson we learn is the lesson of the manger. And this is a very simple one, but I, I just thought it was, it was kind of neat as I was thinking about it. It's the lesson of the manger that Jesus turns the average into the exceptional. He turns the average into the exceptional. I want you to think about the manger that Jesus was born in. It was just a manger. There was nothing special about it. It wasn't made out of gold. It, wasn't, it wasn't, didn't come from, from some special tree. It was probably put together by a part of some old wood that had fallen apart somewhere else, and they put a manger together. It was, it was what they fed the animals out of. It was a feeding trough. And think about the manger. Nothing special about it whatsoever. And do you realize that for 2,000 years, how many songs have been written about a manger? That the, the name of the manger has been mentioned. Why? Because God took the, the normal, the ordinary, and he made it exceptional. So what's the point? The point is this, that when Jesus, the Son of God, flesh, came to this earth, and he was placed in something that was, that was ordinary, that was overlooked, that, that no one really cared about. As soon as Jesus became a part of the manger, that manger became something that we remember even today. And I'm talking to you about it today, and it will continue to be talked about until Jesus returns. Is the specialty of the manger, that one manger. And the same way when you look at all of our lives, all of us, if I said, how many ordinary normal people are here, many of us would raise their hands. Some people say, I'm a little abnormal, or you'd tell someone else they're weird, but that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the reality that we are ordinary people, and there is nothing special about us until the king of the universe comes and takes up home inside of our lives. And then we go from, just like any manger, there are thousands and hundreds of thousands of, of, of mangers, of, of these, these feeding troughs that, are, that were all throughout Israel. But this one became different the moment the God of the universe set his son down in it. It became extraordinary. It became, it's, it, instead of natural, it became supernatural. And the manger is this wonderful symbol of what can happen in our lives when we actually open our lives up to say, Jesus, I accept you into my life. Take all that I am, all of my brokenness, all of my emptiness, all of my stinkiness, all of what I'm not, and I embrace you into my life. And then Jesus turns you into something that can be talked about from years to come because of what you allowed Jesus to do in your life. Amen. And that's just the, the message of the manger. So when you look at the manger over the next several weeks, look at it and think that thing was ordinary, but Jesus made it extraordinary. You are ordinary, but Jesus can make you supernatural and extraordinary. That's the simple message. Number five, what other message can we learn from, from, the, um, from the nativity is this. We can learn the lessons from Jesus, Jesus, baby Jesus in the manger. And the lesson is this, God became one of us so that we could be one of his. That's the message. It's a very simple message, but it's a powerful message. At the center of all of this is this, baby Jesus. That's what this nativity is about. It's not about anything else. It's not about the stables, not about the angels, not about the animals. None of this would even be here if Jesus wasn't there in the, in the center. And the journey that Jesus took to make his way to Bethlehem and, and the story behind it. And it's this beautiful, powerful understanding that, that, that one of the persons of the Godhead who had existed from the beginning of time, who helped create the universe... The one who, who, who knew all things. He was the Son of God. The, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They, they were in perfect unity, perfect harmony. He sat on the throne of heaven. He laid aside the unimaginable glory of heaven to come and to be one of us. But there was a purpose behind it. He came for you. He left his palace of heaven to come so that you could become one of his. 
He gave it all up for you. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says this. For you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. So that through his poverty you might become rich. Through his poverty you might become rich. He became everything that you are so that we could become everything that he is. That is righteous and holy and redeemed in relationship with the Father, no longer, no longer bound to the sin of our past or the, or the mistakes of our present, that we could become one of his, part of his family, clean and with a new name. And he calls me his son. And he calls you his daughter and his son. This is what this is all about. God took on human flesh so that he could communicate to us that he knows what it's like to be one of us. Some people say that God became flesh so that he could understand what it means to be one of us. I, I don't agree with that. God's all-knowing, therefore he doesn't, he doesn't need to, to, to find out what it means to be something. He already knows what it means to be something because he's God. But God became flesh in his son Jesus Christ so that you and I would understand in our, in our deep moments of, of emptiness or loneliness or darkness that he actually understands what it means because God became one of us, so that we could become one of his. Lesson number six that we get from the nativity comes from the angels. The angels that spoke to the shepherds, the angels that spoke to Mary. And this is the message of the angels. And I want you to hear this today, and hopefully this will transform some of your lives. You don't have to live in fear. You don't have to live in fear. So many of us, are, are we are riddled by fear. We are controlled by fear. We, we wake up in the morning, fear hits us. We go to bed at night and fear hits us. This isn't to make you feel bad. It's for you to hear the life-giving message of God today. You don't have to live in fear anymore. You don't have to live in fear that you don't know what's going to happen and you don't know. You don't have to rehearse over and over and over all the bad things that might and possibly could happen. You don't have to be afraid. And that's what the angel said in Luke chapter 2. says this, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you and he is Christ the Lord. You do not have to live in fear. You don't have to do it. And that's the wonderful message of Christmas. That's the wonderful message of this story that God put all the people and all the, he set all the things into motion. That we need to understand this and emphasize it every year. Fear not. You do not need to be in fear. And Satan loves to make you fearful. He loves to make you wake up in the morning and worry about everything. Worry about your kids, worry about your marriage, worry about your money, worry about your job, worry about your car, worry about the, the economy, worry about the president, worry about who's not the president, worry about, I mean, worry about ISIS, worry about terrorism, worry, like there is, trust me, there are plenty of things to worry about. But the message of God is do not fear. Do not worry. You do not have to be afraid because when you serve the God of the universe, he is in control and you are not, so stop freaking out like you are. And trust him. Trust him. And I think probably the root of fear probably has a lot to do with secretly or not so secretly, all of us are control freaks. And so when something doesn't go our way, we try to figure out how do we make it go our way. And if it doesn't go our way, we get cranky that it's not our way. Because ultimately, we're control freaks. And so instead of coming back to the beginning and saying, hang on, hang on a minute. I serve a God who is in control. And I can release these things to the Lord. And I can say, Lord, I trust you. And I, I, I don't have to fear. Yes, this concerns me. And I can pray about this. And yes, that concerns me. And I can pray about it. But I'm not to live in fear. God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Amen. That's God's promise to you. That's God's promise to you today. The seventh lesson we can learn from the nativity is from the shepherds. 
And the shepherd's lesson is this. Once you find Jesus, share your experience with somebody else, with others. This is the beautiful message. God chose the shepherds, one of the first Christmas audience. They got to come. They got to show up. And they were, they were, they were outcast. They were not in the, in the upper echelon of, of important people. They were just shepherds. And I love God's beautiful, wonderful sense of humor. He intentionally sent the angels to these smelly shepherds rather than the King Herod or a high priest somewhere. He sent the angels to the shepherds. And when the shepherds found baby Jesus in the manger, they left and they could not keep their mouths shut. And they were telling everybody, you won't believe what happened. The angels appeared, then we went to, to the Bethlehem and we found the baby that the angels told us about. And you won't believe it. And that's why we find in Luke 2, 17, it says this, when they had seen Jesus, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. So here's the message of the shepherds. It's not about anything else. It's this. Once you find Jesus, it's time for you to share that experience with somebody else. Let your light, let your, let your life and your light shine like the shepherds. That once they found him, once the angels appeared and they, they found Jesus, they left their saying like, you, I found Jesus. Listen, you don't have to have a PhD to tell someone about Jesus. You're just a beggar telling another beggar where to get bread. I found bread. Go get it. It's free. Go eat of it. It tastes good. It'll change your life. That's what the shepherds did. And that's the message to us through the nativity. When you see the shepherds, don't think there's just some weird thing looking here. It's actually the message. Oop, knocked over a sheep. Oh, knocked over a donkey. There we go. We're back in it now. The message is that the shepherds, once they found Jesus, they told other people. And here's my, here's my encouragement to you. When's the last time you told someone about Jesus? I don't, want, I don't be condemned. I just, want, I just want to ask you the question. If you found Jesus, if the answer is yes, when's the last time you've told someone else about what you've found? That's all. And this is a beautiful time of year to begin to share the incredible message of Jesus. See that, see that baby Jesus right there? I found him, and he changed my life. The next lesson we learn from the nativity is Number eight, we can learn from the star. And the star says this, when you genuinely search for God, you will find him. When you genuinely search for God, you're going to find him. Jeremiah 29, 13 says this, you will seek me. This is God speaking. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. Now we know that the wise men, and I don't want to, Pop your bubble. Wise men didn't show up at the nativity. They came about a year later. Now, some people said if they would have been wise women, they would have showed up on time. <laughs> well, that's funny. Actually, it says this. Um, I, I'll read. Well, never mind. I'll get there later. Matthew 2. This is what it says. The star they had seen, speaking of um, the wise men, the wise men had seen the star. When it rose, went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And this is the supernatural light that they followed it. And they sought after it. God had spoken to them and they, they had continued to seek to go after the star. Try to find what this is. They knew that God was speaking to them. They knew that God was, was, was doing something special and new. But the star represents many of us today. That our life is to shine. And the challenge to us today is if people were to follow the light of your life, would it lead them to Jesus? The Magi followed the light of the star. And it led them to Jesus. If people around you were to follow the light that you shine, would it lead them to Jesus? 
And that's what God wants us to be. He wants us to be a light. That's why Christmas, I love Christmas season because it's about pointing people to Jesus. It's about helping people understand that this whole message of the nativity and the, and the, and the animals and the stable and the angel, and it's all about the one in the middle. It's all about Jesus. And he shines, and we are to shine to point people to him. Daniel 12, 3 says this, those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forevermore. There, there is a brightness that comes from your light, from your life as you represent Jesus. And the last message we learn from the nativity today is this, number nine, we learn it from the Magi, give your best to Jesus because he is worth it. Give your best to Jesus because he's worth it. We know that the wise men were very important people. They were magi. We don't know if there was two of them or 30 of them. We just say three because of the song, We Three Kings. We don't know how many. And the reality is they were these men that were important. And they had an audience with the king, and they had all types of, of things. They, they, were, they were wealthy. They were influential. As I said earlier, I, 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 I did read something, and I'll just I'll tell you the whole thing. I did read something that says that, it's, it was a funny article. It says, if the Magi would have been women, one, they would have showed up on time. Two, they would have asked for directions so they could get there on time. Three, they would have helped deliver the baby. Then after that, they would have cleaned the stable. They would have made a casserole. And they would have brought some practical gifts instead of frankincense and myrrh. So. <laughs> but these, these magi, they were on a journey. And they were pursuing what God had spoken to them. And they didn't quit. It was months. Maybe it could have been years. That they kept moving. They kept following. They didn't stop. They didn't get distracted. They didn't stop over and say, forget it. We've been traveling for, for three months and we're not there yet. They kept pressing forward. And this is what wise men do. They keep seeking God until he leads them to Jesus. They keep seeking God until you get your answer. You don't give up. You don't quit. You don't throw in the towel. You don't say it's too far. You say, I'm going to keep seeking God because I'm not going to quit. I'm going to be a wise man. And this is God's encouragement to you. No matter what you're facing, keep seeking God. No matter if you're in financial trouble, keep seeking God. God. No matter if your marriage is on the brink, keep seeking God. No matter if you're struggling with depression like you've never struggled, keep seeking God. If you're riddled with anxiety today, keep seeking God. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. And this is God's word to us today, is don't give up. But this is the beauty of these wise men. Part of not giving up was the posture and the attitude of their hearts. And we see that when they make it to Jesus and they come and we find in Matthew 2.11. And remember this whole, Mary, Mary was the one who, who gave the story of all of this. Because no, none of the writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, weren't, none of them were there. Mary is the one they interviewed and this is what Mary says. I believe it says, they saw the child with his mother, Mary. And they bowed down and they worshiped him. And they opened up their treasures and they presented him with gifts of gold and of frankincense and of myrrh. And I know that these three gifts have significance to the burial of Jesus. But the reality is this. They, these important men, they came and they bowed down and they worshiped. They bowed down and they worshiped. They humbled themselves. They humbled themselves in their position. And they bowed down. And they worshipped. They could have walked over to Jesus and said, there he is. They could have had a servant come and present the gifts. No, they interacted. They engaged with the living child. And these men who were used to being in the presence of kings, 
walked into a little room somewhere where a little toddler was goo going and, and gaggling and whatever else, and they bowed down and they worshiped Jesus. They worshiped him. And this Christmas, my challenge to you is, when's the last time you took your life and you humbled it before God? And it wasn't about your pride. When's the last time that you, that you faced a, a difficulty in your marriage? Well, really what was needed was humility and you humbled yourself before Jesus because you're submitted to him. When's the last time in your interaction with your, with your children that you went to them and you humbled yourself before Jesus and you said, I'm sorry that I reacted that way. When's the last time that you looked at your finances and you realized I've gotten some things out of order and you humbled yourself before Jesus and you came into alignment with his will and his purpose for your life? When's the last time you said, Lord, this isn't about me or my pride or my position. This is about humbling myself before you. And you gave Jesus your best. You gave him your best. You gave him all that you are. You gave him your brokenness. You gave him your, your, everything. You gave him all that you are. God, I give you my best. I give you my life. I give you my future. I give you my family. I give you my finances. And you bow down. You don't check the box of Jesus. You actually bow down and you submit to him and you recognize he is superior and I am not. And I think that's the invitation the Lord has towards and for all of us this year. This is the year that we bow down and we worship him. This is the year that we surrender all of the stuff the striving after position, the victim mentality, and we just bow down and we worship him. And I believe that's what the Lord is speaking to us today through this beautiful picture of the nativity.